um, I looked at, I ended up looking at, um, what did I look at? n pi plus or minus epsilon over 2. When I calculate that, I get this, which ends up giving me cosine n pi e to the minus, but cosine's even, so it eats the minus, eats the plus or minus, and we just leave, leaves us with minus 1 to the n. Cos cosine n pi is minus 1 to the n. Um, cosine of epsilon over 2, well that's the same value despite the fact that I have different inputs which shows you that there's two points in the epsilon ball which don't map, which map to the same value and yet they're different. Therefore, the function's not one to one in that epsilon, epsilon disk. Epsilon being arbitrary, that answers the question. And um, this one is a little bit trickier, but um, I thought about what, I, what, do I, what am I trying to accomplish? I'm trying to accomplish, I'm plugging in something, and when I work out what that looks like, it's e to the r cubed, e to the 3i theta. I want to choose different inputs that give me the same output. So to make that happen, I just need to have different thetas which give me the same output for e to the 3i theta. Easy way to do that, put theta equal to 0, or put theta equal to 2 pi over 3. If I put theta equal to 2 pi over 3, e to the 3i theta, also e to the 2 pi i, e to the 0, e to the 2 pi i, both give me 1. So if I look at epsilon over 2, which is theta 0, or if I look at epsilon over 2 times e to the 2 pi over 3, those both map to the same output, even though they're distinct inputs, which shows me that the mapping is not 1 to 1. So apparently this is always possible, um, you know, if the derivative is 0, right? That's a place where the function is not um, locally invertible, right? Our inverse function theorem said that the function has a local inverse if the derivative is non-zero at the point. Then we can find an inverse. Otherwise, not usually. Otherwise, no, I think, but... Now, <clears throat> oh man, I think it... Well, that's annoying. I think it ate one of my pages, guys. Well, I'm gonna have to rescan it. I'm sorry. Listen, so for problem 14, which is infinitely more important than what I was just talking about, that one-to-one -one calculation, because um, like this is something we spent like a week of class on. I should have a homework, I should have a test question on the, you know, can build a Mobius transformation kind of problem should be on there. There should definitely be a question like that. Um, so this one, problem 14, there's two, why do they stand outside and talk? I just, so dumb, so very dumb. Anyway, um, I'll shut up. So the way I had this before is I just did it algebraically. I picked three points and I mapped them. Three points on the edge of the one space to map the three points on the edge of the other space. And I chose, and I was able to use, just use algebra to find the formula. So when I can post the solution, you'll be able to see that, all right? But that was not the instructions we're hinting at, doing it in steps, right? So what I did is like, well, how can I do it in steps? Well, I wanted something from the book that was already kind of like it. So I found an example in the book that was kind of like it in the sense that the thing in the book took a disk to a half plane, right? That's not quite what we want because the problem has the disk over here and it's got the half plane, the lower half plane. So how can I get that? Well, I can take this and I multiply by minus i and that will like that. And I can take this and I can shift that thing minus one like that and then it's where I want it. So then this, I'm trying to map this to this, right? So I can just, I can just uh, go like that. It was what I did. I took z, I undid minus iz by iz, and then I go to this way, which is, hey guys, can you talk somewhere else, please? Thanks. <clears throat> Had it. All right, so. <clears throat> So then, <coughs> oh no. So then, um, th this mapping is in the book. I just copied this from the book, okay? And so I, I plug in iz in the place of z, which I have here. And then down here, I subtract one. So that's the mapping which goes from there to there. So that was the method I used just to, to piggyback off what was in the book. I didn't have a lot of time to come up with this. This is what I thought of today, okay? Um, there are more systematic methods that I, anyway, so like I said, when I post this again, I'll have, <coughs> <coughs> I'll have, 
a whole other page doing that a very different way. And the thing is, when I do it the other way, when I do it the other way, when I do it the other way, instead of finding, th this is the formula from this page, doing the other way, which again, I, my, the, the scanner, uh, the scanner choked where I was scanning before class and it must have missed a page. I had this formula. Well, this formula and that formula are not the same. Does that mean that a given mapping problem, there's more than one Mobius transformation that will map a space to a space? Yes, in fact, so. So there are actually infinitely many different Mobius transformations which will map one half plane to a given disk, but they will do so in a different fashion. If you, wanted a, if you want a specific transference of like a particular three points to another particular three points in a particular order, I think that will uniquely specify the Mobius transformation. But there, how many different choices are there of three points on the edge of a region? and three points on the other edge of a different region. Well, there's, there's many ways to choose those three points. So there's not a uniqueness overall in just the region mapping. Um, but there is a unique answer to the question mapping three points to three points. <laughs> that is unique. So regions map to regions, not uniquely. Um, but triples of points map to triples of points. These are actually very fun, right? It was an odd problem, so you guys should have got this one, right? <laughs> no? Err. Ah. Anyway, so if infinity maps to infinity, it's, it's, it's of the form AZ plus B. It has to be. That's the only way you can get infinity to infinity. It has to be linear. And as such, I can just plug in F of 0 is 0, F of 1 is 1, and that gives me IZ. This one, um, I've got... Uh, let's see here, I've got 0 going to 0. That means there has to be a plane Z in the numerator. That's the only way you can get 0 mapping to 0. Um, if I had like 3 mapping to 0, that would put a Z minus 3 in the numerator. If I had 7i mapping to 0, it would put a Z minus 7i in the numerator. All right? So essentially the factor theorem, but for fraction. And um, so I have that, it's my pattern, and, but I know f of 1 is um, 1. I know f of infinity. So infinity is always like the ratio of the leading coefficients. That's how to do that. So f of infinity is a over b. Well, that equals 2, and I get this and that. But the thing is, I've got one more num letter than I need. See, because you could absorb the a or the b into, the, you could like divide this by a and just like basically divide, bring the a in the, numer in the denominator. I don't need three things. I could have just put a equals to one from the outset. I should have. So anyway, eventually I decided to put b equals to one. And when I do that, it gives me a is two and c is one. There's my formula. Which is in the back of the book. I checked. And um, then you got this one. So here, one is going to infinity. So I want to divide by z minus one. And um, likewise here, one's going to infinity divided by z minus one, zero, um, and the infinity is a over one, which is just a. Over here, infinity is a over, <coughs> which is just a. Hmm. So anyway, I don't think that last problem actually was very much nicer than it might have seemed at first glance. It seemed harder than it was actually probably. Let me go back. <coughs> oh man. The test one. Here we go. <coughs> Put a sharp bound for f of the magnitude of f of z. For f of z equals e to the 2z if e is from the closed unit disk. So you just have to think about the magnitude. The formula for it is e to the 2x. So where can that be biggest on the disk? Well, x ranges from minus 1 to 1, right? So the magnitude is smallest here and it's largest there because that's how the exponential works. The next one is a cube root problem. We kind of talked about something like that a second ago. But this one's the cube root, so we use e to the 2 pi i over 3, which is this guy. All right. um, <clears throat> anyway, Ooh, watch out. Here is a plain old 
work out the derivative by the, you know, I, I think I take the, I give you a choice. Limited difference quotient, continuous differentiability, um, paired with cauchy riemann equations, or by the theorem of Cartier-Dori, your choice. Choosing cauchy riemann equations here would be unwise. Very unwise. Um, find a harmonic conjugate. All right. Yeah, we didn't talk about that yet today, but, well, yes, we did a little bit, but there it is. So, um, prove the power rule. There it is. <coughs> nice test question. Need to know your definition of z to a complex power there, right? Um, as I said, begin by defining c, z to the power c on the slit complex plane. Show that z, z bar is continuous by an explicit careful epsilon delta proof. This is not on your test. I have not emphasized that this semester. So there you go. Tell the engineers. <laughs> Spread the word. Um, answer one of the items below. Uh, a complex differentiable zero zero but not holomorphic zero zero. Or B satisfies cauchy riemann equations zero zero but it's not continuous at zero zero. So I chose B. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sharon's topology experience. <laughs> I named this after Sharon. <laughs> Her name was, it was, well, anyway. <laughs> she never, she, she, I'm never going to have kids. Rah! And then Spran was like, she had, she had a kid. And I was like, ha ha. <laughs> it's good. It's about time. Anyway, um, she's married. So, important. I mean, you never know days. But <clears throat> anyway, so we did have a problem like that. You remember to prove this, prove a half planes open by <coughs> showing the interior point. Um, show f of z equals if, if e, if e to the three i z is locally invertible on all of c and then find a local inverse of f on appropriate domain. So to show that it's different, that it's complex, different, so it's invertible everywhere the derivative is non-zero everywhere. So by the inverse function theorem, a local inverse exists. What is that inverse function? Well, you gotta solve for z. And to solve for z, I have to, I used a principal log, and that only, of course, is going to be legitimate um, for a particular domain, right? <coughs> In this case, I worked it out, it has to be that. That's the domain on which that inverse works. Let's see here. Um, graph. Oh, find a fractional linear transformation from the unit disk to the to that. You know, make that happen. Oh, here and this is the evil. <laughs> it's dead to me now. That's dead to me. So you don't have to like, like yeah. I mean, it'll it'll do it, but yeah, it, yeah, no. Just no, don't do it. It's just better to just put down AZ plus B over CZ plus D and plug in your conditions and work the algebra out. I just, I just, I have a bad feeling about the cross ratio. But anyway, there it is. That is almost like the one that we worked out in the quiz, but. So I guess that answers your question, I think, for the most part. This is pretty much on track with what we've done this year, I think. So, um, I could have used this test, but now I've shown it to you, so. You could have used the other one that I've never seen. Which, which one was that? There's one other one listed on the website. Oh, really? <laughs> See, I'm told, I'm, I'm being told there's another one on my website, huh? Like, sure. Where is this? Oh, this one? Oh, I got two, don't I? Yeah. Uh, it's the interior point, complex differentiable, Cartesian form. I'm just going to scan through Kosh. Show that cosine is cosh iz. Oh man, that's nice. Well, I was too nice. 
That was way too nice back here. Oh, find the formulas for adding angle, angle, angle formulas. I'm mostly just scanning soon to make sure there's no, uh, oh, see this we haven't done yet. No integration yet, yeah. So that's later. Oh, one thing that we didn't see on the test that is, would be reasonable for you guys would be like partial fractions since we had that in the homework. Um, I don't really expect you to know the formula for partial fractions necessarily, but I might ask you to derive it, I guess. That would be the only interesting thing to do. Is the test that you were going over in class just now, is that on your website? No, it's not. <laughs> oh, this is, okay, so that's a great question. Why is this worth so many points? Check this out. 100 points, 100 points, um, 100 points, what do we got here? Um, th I think this one is kind of sort of on track because it um, it doesn't have any uh, yeah so no no this is the same university so the year before the year before Liberty mandated a thousand points per course I had a syllabus because they were kind of suggesting it up to that point there were it was in the like we suggest that you do it. Suggestion became mandate. But before it was mandated, I took the suggestion and I did 10 times. I had 10,000 <laughs> points in my syllabus and I said every point's a point so you'd have 1,000 points on a test or maybe 1,500 points on a test. Your homeworks would be worth 200, 300 points. <laughs> it was great, everything was points. So like all of the homework, every homework problem would be like 10 points. It was very nice for grading, and it was ten times as good as the current system we have. So. <laughs> well, this is. Oh, that's just a typo. It's because I was uh, taking a 332 test and changing it to a 331 test. That is not meaningful. Anyway, I shut up. So. <laughs>